I'm beginning a new series, three message series this month called Wolves in Sheep's Clothing. And um, I'm doing this because of a great concern I have for what's happening in the evangelical church and anticipating as this church moves forward. Um, as you know, in five months, Lord willing, I'll be retiring. I'm not retiring from ministry, but retiring from uh, being your pastor. And Sally and I, Lord willing, will be moving to uh, North Carolina. Sunshine and, well, never mind, I won't, I won't get into that. But I am very concerned, as I know you are, and that's why we come here Saturday at 8 o'clock every Saturday morning, and we pray for the next pastor, we pray for God's will. I know many of you are praying for that as well. But what I see happening in many evangelical churches is so troubling, some of the churches are very well known. Pastors are very well known. It's not my business to delve into what another pastor or another church is doing. I have enough to account for for my own ministry. But as we as a church look ahead, I just want to sound a warning. You know, I am a pastor. The Greek word where that English word pastor comes from means shepherd. A shepherd leads the flock, a shepherd feeds the flock, and a shepherd protects the flock. And we protect the flock from false doctrine, from false ideologies that can come in and steal people's hearts and captivate their minds. In Matthew 7, 15, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Now, I don't believe that some of these prominent evangelical pastors are ravenous wolves. And I, as I'll say, I don't believe that they are preaching a false gospel. There are those out there who are preaching a false gospel. But we'll talk about why I'm so concerned as I think about the future of Grace Bible Church. And so we're talking today about social justice confusion. In July of 2020, I preached two messages on social justice. One was called The Truth About Social Justice. The other one was called The Great Awakening. They're still online if you, if you didn't get a chance to hear those. Critical race theory, intersectionality are things you hear about in culture. They first began to dominate the universities. These ideologies, these theories are an outworking of a godless Marxist ideology. Make no mistake about it. And it has spread to every area of American culture. I said in July 2020 to watch out for three key words of the woke agenda, and those words are diversity, inclusion, and equity. And if you've been paying attention, I'm sure in the last two years you've heard those words in many different settings. Diversity, we would think, would mean bringing people together of diverse backgrounds. That's a good thing. But in the woke world, it means having more diverse representation of different lived experiences of oppression. So it's not about bringing people together of diverse ethnic groups. It's about understanding people and having more representation of people who are, in their opinion, oppressed. Inclusion, we would think that's inclusive. That's a good thing. We as a church want to be inclusive of all people. We don't care your ethnicity. Um, we don't care about your, your background. If we've repented of our sin, we've come together, and Christ brings us together. But in the work, woke world, inclusion becomes exclusion. Inclusion means that anyone from a dominant group, white people, must be censored, must be silenced, and must be excluded. We have nothing to say. And you can't hold up truth because if you say, but I'm not honestly a racist person. I don't feel we as a church are a racist congregation. You can't say that because that proves you're racist because truth in their mind is a white construction. So you, <laughs> you sort of get it on both ends. What about equality? Equality is a good thing. Fairness, impartiality. But that's not what the woke world means about equality. In the woke world, it means adjusting shares so that outcomes are made equal for everybody. It comes from social equity theory. 
which is basically socialism. These ideologies, this ideology of social justice has reached into every part of American culture all the way from the very top to the bottom. Many of you are aware that President Biden recently went to Mexico. The White House, on his return, released six commitments that were secured through the meeting. And number one was a pledge to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, yes, this has spread to all areas of government, the military, corporations, education. But my concern and should be your concern, is how it is spread to the church and, sadly, even the evangelical church. Pastor Michael Yusuf says, this is another one of those enemies' deceptions that is sneaking into the church to take our eyes off Jesus and the eternal perspective and the fact that only he can give us eternal life, forgiveness of sins, redemption. Therefore, we must, he must be the focus. Now, I'm not surprised, and I'm sure many of you are not surprised, that the liberal churches, the mainline churches as a whole, pretty much have embraced the social gospel ideology. After all, they are the ones who long ago embraced the social gospel. Many churches that uh, preached the true gospel, that saw people saved and discipled and sent out missionaries, are now basically mausoleums. They're filled with spiritually dead people who talk about love and might even give a wink at the Bible, but you'll never hear anything about repentance. You'll never hear anything about sin. You'll never hear the true gospel preached with power and conviction. Many true Christians continue to be confused about this whole issue, all these calls for social justice. Isn't that a good thing? Don't we all want justice? Isn't racism wrong? Isn't the history of America and the slavery as such a black mark on our history? It was wicked. It was evil. Segregation, Jim Crow law, all that was wicked. All that was evil. We do not deny that. We understand that America does not have a perfect history. Isn't justice the practice of what is just and what is right? But you have to understand that the current ideology of social justice is not justice as defined by God. Owen Strachan in his excellent book, Christianity and Wokeness, says, It has become very hard to be a person of virtue on racial matters today, but it has become very easy to be a racist. Dr. Anthony Wood, a pastor from California, has an excellent outline on biblical justice, and I borrowed his outline, though I've filled in my own subpoints. His outline of the characteristics of biblical justice, the justice revealed in Scripture, is true justice. Biblical justice is rooted in the nature of God, and we've talked about that before. Justice, biblical justice, true justice, is rooted in the nature of God. Isaiah 30, verse 18, for the Lord is a God of justice. Justice in the Bible is an objective thing. We have the Ten Commandments. We have many commandments, Old Testament and New Testament. So any worldview that denies God is going to have a real hard time defining true justice. And so biblical justice is rooted in God's very nature. Biblical justice is retributive. Retributive. Psalm verse 9, verse 16, the Lord is known by the judgment he executes. The wicked is snared in, the, snared in the work of his own hands. There are penalties for sin. Um, there are penalties for certain crimes. You see that clearly stated in Scripture. God has vested his authority into civil government and into parental authority. And as far as civil government goes, in Romans 13, civil government is to reward the good and punish the evil. So what is going on with our justice system in America? Because retributive justice is being replaced by distributive justice, reapportioning privilege. So this is a redefined 
read the focused, quote unquote, justice. Biblical justice is impartial, impartial. Many places in the Bible, it talks about the fact that there's no partiality with God. Romans 2.11 is one of them. This is why Lady Justice is pictured blindfolded, because justice, true justice, is supposed to be impartial. God will judge everyone according to his word. Doesn't matter our ethnicity, doesn't matter our sex. God is going to judge us according to his word. And biblical justice is inescapable. Inescapable. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Pastor Brian stood here and said, this table is for sinners. We're all sinners, every one of us. And God doesn't play favorites. God doesn't care, uh, doesn't set one ethnic group above another ethnic group. Jesus Christ was not a white man. He was a Middle Eastern Jew. And so the idea that one race is superior to another race is not found in Scripture. And we will all be judged individually. Now, those of us who know Christ as our Savior... We're going to stand before Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our judge in the sense that we're going to give an accounting for our Christian life. But there's no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. Our our sin was paid for on the cross. But if you do not know Christ as your Savior and you enter into eternity, you will stand before a holy God one day. And he will condemn you for your sin. It's inescapable. But here's the good news. Biblical justice is solvable. It's solvable. What hope can I have as a sinner standing before a holy God who's completely righteous? What hope can I possibly have? Religion isn't going to give me that hope. Good works isn't going to give me that hope. Well, God provided a solution in the death, in the burial, and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans 3.24, being justified freely, that means made right with God, freely, without a cause, by his grace, unmerited favor, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 3.26, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. I love that verse. God can still be holy and still make us right with him because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And that is the only way. This is the gospel. This is the whole gospel. And we don't need anything added to it or anything taken away from it. This is the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. Jesus took our place on the cross. Jesus took our punishment from God the Father that we deserve. This is the doctrine of propitiation. Propitiation basically means satisfaction. God is a just God... And so justice is inescapable. He must judge sin, and he judged sin on Christ. So when I confess Christ as Savior, repent of my sin, and trust Jesus and will follow him with my life, then the Bible says God justifies me. He makes me right with him. And God can be very just in doing that. 1 John 2, 2, he is himself a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the whole world. So God's justice was satisfied by Jesus on the cross. doesn't mean everybody's going to be saved. It means you have to individually, personally trust Christ as your Savior and trust him to pay for your sins. And Romans 3.22 says, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. To go to heaven, you have to be as good as God is. And the only way to do that is to get a righteousness that we don't have. It's a gift from God based on what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. I find it so sad that people are clamoring for justice, clamoring for justice, like this is some kind of new concept, when our God is a God of justice. Now, my concern in this series of messages is social justice coming into the church, because the introduction of social justice ideology into the church breeds confusion and breeds division. One of the key tenets of the social justice movement is critical race theory, and you hear some of that CRT in the news and whatever. Do you understand what that is? Critical race theory basically asserts that there's a hidden racism pervasive throughout our culture, 
all white people are racist. Whether you know it or not, whether you think you are or not, and if you try to present facts, that just proves you're racist because presenting facts is a white construction. So you can see how Satan weaves his wickedness to try to paint people into a corner. Their goal is not that the different ethnicity groups will get along. That's not their goal. Their goal of social justice ideology is to deconstruct society, to deconstruct American culture, primarily to focus on the American family and the American church. Marxists and communists, all you have to do is read history. For a long time, they have said they know they can never conquer America militarily, hopefully, and so they have decided what they call the long march through the institutions, and it started in education, and it has spread its tentacles into every part of culture, but one of their primary targets is the American family and the American church. We are one of the barriers, a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church that stands in the way of their godless ideology. Now, this is a great paradox when all these people are talking about social justice and racism because social justice at its core is blatant racism, blatant racism. And you hear these different names and these different authors that promote this ideology, Ashley Shackelford, all white people are racist. They don't try to hide this. This is what they want to teach in our schools. This is what they are promoting through the media and, and, and through the internet and all kinds of ways. Shakia Walker Barnes in her book, A Rhythm of Prayer, a collection of meditations for renewal. You want to hear one of her prayers? Dear God, please help me to hate white people or at least to want to hate them. How in the world? Do you ever wonder why when these people are talking about you know, racial equality and justice and social justice. Why are we so divided? Why is there so much hatred? Why is there so much division? Because that is foundation. That's exactly what they want. They don't want to see the races get along. They want trouble. They want division. They want to deconstruct our culture. And they are doing it. Only the gospel has the power to bring unity out of diversity. And I think the error that many evangelical pastors are committing, I don't think it's soteriology. That's the doctrine of salvation. Do I think some of these men are preaching a false gospel? No, I don't believe that for a minute. Now, there are people out there preaching a false gospel. There are people out there saying racial, you know, uh, racial um, getting along racially should be part of the gospel. Most of these men don't say that. They preach the gospel. I think the error is in ecclesiology. That's the doctrine of the church. What, what are we supposed to do as a church? What is our focus of Grace Bible Church? Why are we even here? We are here to preach the gospel. We're here to spread the gospel. We're here to make disciples. We're, we're here to teach and train the next generation. We're here to found churches. We're here to, uh, to send out missionaries and support missionaries. The mission of the church is not racial reconciliation. And ra racial reconciliation is not a component of the gospel. That's adding to the gospel. That's what Paul was talking about in Galatians chapter 1. This is all a component of what many are calling neo-paganism. We are definitely falling into paganism as a culture, meaning a new paganism. And they're not throwing us to the lions yet, but our culture has definitely become, in many places, a pagan culture. And if you try to combat racism with the cult of wokeness, it's going to produce and is producing the exactly opposite effect. Now, we know that Satan has been trying to bring division into the church since its inception. And we know what Jesus said, the gates of hell will never prevail against the church. Satan cannot destroy the church, but he can bring division. He can bring confusion. And all we have to do is look at church history. 
and see that Satan loves to breed false doctrine, false teaching, breed division. He started it way back in the book of Acts. Remember in Acts 6, there was a problem between the, the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews, and the Judean Jews because they felt their widows were not being properly cared for. There was kind of a prejudice in the Jerusalem church. And so the disciples found out about it and they dealt with it. And then the gospel going to the Gentiles created a whole new group of issues in the early church. Now, you and I can't really appreciate the depth of hatred, hatred between Gentiles and Jews. Uh, the Jews saw the Gentiles as unclean. They wouldn't they wouldn't go into their home. They wouldn't have any kind of dealings with them. They, they wouldn't eat with them. There was this definite division between Jews and Gentiles. And so now Gentiles are being saved and a part of the church. What about this racial divide, this ethnic divide, social divide that was happening between these two groups? And so Paul's confrontation of Peter here in Galatians chapter 2 in verses 11 through 21 really reveals the depth of that divide. Now, Paul does not name who these false teachers are coming into the churches of Galatia, that area that Paul had been planting churches in. Many believe they're called Judaizers because they seem to have the marks of that or some type of Gnosticism. And so, basically, they were spreading a false gospel. It was the gospel plus. Anytime you hear the gospel plus, that's a false gospel. So they were preaching, yes, uh, the, you need to be saved through faith in Jesus, but then you need to be circumcised, and you need to keep the law of Moses and keep these other traditions of the Jews. And so this was what Paul was confronting in the letter to the churches of Galatia. And so what's happening here, look here, we're in Galatians chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 11. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, of course, this is Paul talking, because he was to be blamed. For there were certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. Now, I'm not drawing a direct parallel to what's happening today, but I think that if you can kind of look at this and sort of see some similarity as to what's happening. Notice, first of all, the rebuke, the rebuke. If you recall in Acts chapter 10, the Lord gave Peter a special vision so that he would go to the house of a Gentile, which a Jew would not do, named Cornelius. And so Peter is obedient to the Lord. He goes to the house of Cornelius. Cornelius has all these family and people there. Peter preaches the gospel. They get saved. Peter goes back to the church in Jerusalem at Acts chapter 11, and he reports that now the gospel is going to the Gentiles. And you have to, you and I can't really appreciate what a change this was. I mean, this was earth shattering. The Jews and Gentiles would be in, in one body. We take that for granted now because we've had the scriptures for so long. But for them, this was amazing. And so at some point, the gospel went from Jerusalem north. A church in Antioch was planted. This becomes the first primarily Gentile church. Yes, there are Jews there, but a number of Gentiles are in this church in Antioch. And at some point, Peter came to the church in Antioch. When Peter gets there because of what his experience with, you know, going to Cornelius and seeing Gentiles being saved and they're all part of one body, God's no respecter of persons. So Peter comes and he freely fellowships with the Gentiles in the church. He's eating with them. They're, they're having a wonderful time together. They have great liberty to do this. And then all of a sudden, some Jews came from Jerusalem. Now, it says here they came from James. It seems doubtful that James actually sent them. These are probably some of, if they were Judaizers, probably some of them. And so when Peter sees these Jews, the, the Greek language here suggests that Peter began to withdraw. He had been freely eating and fellowshipping with the Gentiles. 
Now that these Jews are there, Peter begins to withdraw from them. You know, Jesus plus a social or racial standard distorts the gospel. Jesus plus any social or racial standard distorts the gospel. Peter was, in essence, giving preference to the Jews as opposed to the Gentiles. And the gospel reveals that there's not one group that's better than another. God is impartial. And Paul, later on in Galatians chapter 3, Paul will write, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. We're all sinners. doesn't matter our ethnicity. We all need to come to Jesus. And when we come to Jesus, now in the church age, we are all part of one body, the church of Jesus Christ. What was the result of Peter's hypocrisy? Because that's what Paul calls it. He calls it hypocrisy. Verse 13. The rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him. So that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. You have to understand that Paul and Barnabas were instrumental ministering in that church in Antioch. For some point, apparently either Paul was away or something, and then Peter came. And remember, this is Peter and Paul, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter. These guys are foundational, humanly speaking, to the church. You read the book of Acts, and the first half is pretty much about Peter's ministry. Second half is pretty much about Paul's ministry. These guys are just, you know, solid apostles. And so now... Paul confronts Peter to his face in front of the congregation of Antioch. This was a monumental thing. And Paul calls it hypocrisy. And the result was that because of Peter doing this, Barnabas was caught up in this, and then even the other Jews that were there, they all began to separate from the Gentiles. It shows the influence and impact of church leaders. I believe many prominent evangelical pastors are causing confusion, not only in their own congregations, and some of their congregations are hemorrhaging membership and they are hemorrhaging leaders because the focus has gone off the gospel onto this whole social justice issue. And many of these pastors are prominent and many people follow them on social media, and it's just very concerning of the kind of influence they're having. Make no mistake about it, social justice ideology is from the mind of Satan. It is a damnable doctrine. And I'm not saying that these pastors have given over to Satan. I'm not saying that. I just think it's a great error. And I'm concerned about the next pastor of Grace Bible Church. That you need to, I told the pastors and deacons this, and I'll tell you because you are the members. You members are the ones who will make the final decision as to who your next pastor will be because you get to interview, you get to vote. You better check them out on this issue. You better make sure that he's not woke as we understand what that means. Not that he's not concerned about racial issues, not that he's not concerned, you know, about what's happening in culture. There's a real balance there. And if you get a pastor in here who is very woke, and I, I, I've seen it, there's, there's a church where we're going to be moving. And um, good church, had a pastor there for a long time. He retired. They brought a pastor in, found out after he was in there that he was very woke. And he's dismantling the church. That's my greatest fear. Not that I don't have confidence in you. I just feel it's my responsibility to give you that, that warning. And so external standards, external standards always breed division in the body of Christ. What did Jesus pray? Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me that they may be one as we are, John 17, 11. The church at the beginning was in danger of splitting over racial and social markers. Would there be a Gentile church and a Jewish church? Do you understand that this 
could have between Peter and Paul. You understand that this could have, have generational impact on the church if this issue was allowed to spread and continue. So what was the resolution? Verse 14. Here's Paul's writing. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? Paul understood the very nature and purity of the gospel was at stake. This was no peripheral issue. Was Peter preaching a false gospel? No. Peter would never do that. It was because of Peter's actions, because of Peter giving preference, because of Peter still not totally embracing the fact that Jews and Gentiles were together in one church. Paul says it had to do with the gospel. It wasn't he was preaching a false gospel, but he was acting in a way that was not reflecting the true gospel. The legalists sought to build walls where Jesus had torn the walls down. And I see that same thing with social justice ideology. Not that America has ever gotten overrated. Not that there aren't racial pockets. Not that there aren't people who are right. We understand all of that. Racism is a hard issue. But I would say generally, if you talk to most people, they don't, they don't see themselves as racist. America has turned a corner. But you see, the problem is these social social justice ideologues, they say that what Martin Luther King Jr. said, that I want to hope my children grow up in in a country where they're not judged by the color of their skin, but the strength of their character. They say to us, if you repeat that, that's racism. If you say that, you know, what Martin Luther King... I mean, who would have ever thought that people would condemn him for saying that? Because this isn't about the ethnic groups getting along. This is an ideology that is penetrating our culture, that is starting to come into our churches, and its sole purpose is division, deconstruction, attack on the gospel. Because it's the only power of God, the only power that can hinder this false ideology. And so what was the answer to legalism here? The doctrine of justification. Paul defines it in verses 15 and 16. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh shall be justified. Paul is talking to Peter, and the we here is primarily the Jewish Christians in Antioch. And he's saying, look, why are you you going away from this? Don't you understand that that we are all justified by faith in Jesus? Justified means to be made right with God. And so knowing that a man that's general is not justified by works, even we that's personal have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith. No flesh, universal, shall be justified. Paul is driving his point home that the only way to be right with God is through faith in Jesus Christ. There is no other way. It's what Jesus meant when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. There's no amount of work that a sinner can do to be right with God. If you think coming to church, if you think taking communion... If you think being a good person and a moral person, it's all good things. But if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, your sin is, you've not been justified. You've not been made right with God. That only happens through personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the cure for racism is the gospel. Sinful actions come out of a depraved heart. Jesus clearly taught that in Matthew chapter 15, verse 19. Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and murders, et cetera, and et cetera. No amount of law-keeping, no laws on the books can change a person's heart. 
Thankfully, the Jim Crow laws, thankfully, the racial discrimination laws, none of those exist in America, and we're very thankful for that. That's something to praise the Lord for, because any kind of prejudice, any kind of segregation, any kind of racism is sinful, it's wicked, it's wrong, it's outside the will of God. But no amount of law-keeping can change a person's heart. Paul's reminding Peter and the other Jewish believers what they already knew. Verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. (laughs) Paul's saying, I've been crucified with Christ. Through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we share in his death, burial, resurrection, the gospel. The law has no claim on a dead person. That's what Paul is saying here. Any form of legalism cancels the effect of the cross. The only thing powerful enough to change the racism in a person's heart is the gospel. Is the gospel. We're not going to... We're not going to help someone who who is struggling with hating someone of another ethnic group by going and and certainly not with CRT and intersectionality and social justice ideology. It's not designed to do that. It's designed to bring further division. With all this talk about racial and social justice, why is there so much division? Why is there so much hatred? Because that's exactly what it is designed to do, and it's doing it. Why do you want to jump on the bandwagon when you understand the roots of these things? It, I don't understand it. I think many of these pastors mean well. I think they desire to, to speak into the culture. Just in my own personal view, I think it has caused great confusion and great division. When you read the literature about all this, you certain names come up that are very prominent in the social justice movement. Ibram Kendi is one of those. He writes, how to be an anti-racist? The only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. Do you understand the paradox of that statement? The only answer to discrimination is discrimination. It's not anti-racist discrimination. It's not cross-discrimination. It's not counter-discrimination. Discrimination is discrimination. For white people to discriminate against black people is wrong. For black people to discriminate against white people is wrong. It's discrimination. It's ungodly. It's out of the will of God. Closing. I know sometimes I say closing and I go on for 10 more minutes. In closing, 2 Timothy 2, Paul writes to Timothy, avoid foolish and ignorant disputes knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil having been taken captive by him to do his will. Many are being taken captive by this social justice ideology. And we do them no service by following along with the the current trend. There are some very prominent evangel... And I purposely not mention names. It's not my... I'm not judging men. I'm just saying there are some very prominent men who have had special services so they can stand up and they can repent for the sins of America. For the, how come we going to repent for something that happened hundreds of years ago? That's not even biblical. I'm to repent for my sin. I can't repent for your sin. And I certainly can't repent for the sin of our, the forefathers of America. We can acknowledge it was wrong. We can be thankful it's not like that anymore. We can do our part to make sure that we as a church, that my family, that we as an individual do not practice any form of racism, but we love everybody and we want to see everybody come into the kingdom because at the end of time, we've already been told somebody from every ethnic group is going to be around the throne of Christ. Nobody's going to be excluded. There'll be a representative from every ethnic group. So who are we to stand up and think that we're 
we're better than, than, than somebody else because of the color of our skin or the, way, the, the culture that we were raised in. That never comes from the mind of Christ, only the mind of Satan. We must not deviate from the preaching of the gospel. That's why we are here as a church. And my concern is if you get a man here in this pulpit, and he turns out to be a social justice champion, or he has some kind of woke attitude, he will divide this church. I guarantee it. And so I've challenged the pastors and deacons. You better really vet these people. And you as a congregation, you need to be informed. You need to ask some questions. And don't be afraid to ask them. Because any pastor that's going to be faithful to the word and wants to stick with preaching the gospel will not be offended if you ask him some of these questions. And he won't be falling all over himself trying to justify some kind of wishy-washy attitude towards the social justice agenda or the whole homosexual agenda that we'll deal with eventually in this series. It's got tied into social justice, which is a misnomer in itself right there. So this is just a message of warning. And I, I have confidence in our pastors and our deacons, in you, that you would not let that happen. But you need to be aware of what's happening in so many areas of the evangelical church. Many churches, I'm sure, where good, godly people thought this could never happen here. And they're watching it happen to their own church. So just, as Paul would tell Timothy, don't become captive by a false doctrine.